Okay. Our next speaker is Scott Hales. Scott has been a historian and writer for the Church History Department since 2015. He currently works as a writer and story editor for Saints. And as always, you can read more about, his, his, about him on the website. So with that short introduction, here is Scott Hales. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I did notice that um, following my presentation, we will have a snack break. So think of this as story time before snack time, if you like. Um, so as, as you can tell, uh, as you can see from uh, the screens here, uh, my presentation is on women's stories uh, in Saints, the story of the Church of Jesus Christ in the latter days. The next question you may have is, what is Saints? And if you haven't visited the Saints display yet in the back of the room, I will give you a brief uh, overview of what it's about. If you have even more interest after I talk today about it, on Friday you'll be able to hear uh, Stephen Harper uh, speak about the project in more detail. Uh, but Saints is uh, a new four-volume narrative history of the church uh, being researched, uh, written and published under the direction of the First Presidency. Uh, it's the first official multi-volume history of the church since B.H. Roberts' uh, comprehensive history in 1930. It's been uh, a while since then, so we feel a need to, to kind of update uh, church members on uh, what has happened since then. Uh, volume one uh, will appear uh, in less than a month on, on September 4th, uh, 2018. And in fact, I recently uh, had an opportunity to go to the printing press down in Salt Lake City where the first copies of Saints were being printed. This was really exciting for me. Uh, you can see here them coming uh, off the press, and uh, there's a nice uh, palette of them stacked up. You can see that it's a very big book. Uh, it is uh, about 600 pages of narrative of story, um, and then about 70 pages of footnotes for those of you who like those things. Um, and then also an index and some other material as well. So the entire book uh, runs over 700 pages. We hope, though, that you will not use it as a paperweight, but that you will actually open it up and read it. Uh, because it is uh, designed to be a representative uh, global history of the church for a general audience. This is a book that we want all church members to read, uh, you know, whether, you know, regardless of what their educational background is, regardless of what their nationality is, what their culture is, uh, it's designed to be accessible to a wide variety of readers. So it's not designed for an academic audience, uh, but it's, it's more for a general audience. And if you have had the chance to read some of Saints on uh, the Gospel Library app, I think we have six chapters uh, on, the, on the Gospel Library right now, uh, you can tell that it is certainly not written for academics, but it is meant to be a story read by all church members. And uh, I like to say uh, oftentimes that it's for anybody in the church from ages 12 to 112, but certainly younger and older than that demographic would certainly like it as well. Um, one other uh, important thing that we can say about saints is that what we've tried to do with it is take uh, solid history, well-researched history, uh, and marry that with uh, a narrative style, a pleasing narrative style, uh, which, which what we might call a literary style, uh, and also to kind of meet the needs of a global audience. And so the idea is to kind of hit a sweet spot between all three of these. And uh, in fact, when I came on as story editor and as a writer, uh, Rick Turley, who was then uh, overseeing the project, uh, told, us, uh, told me and the other creative writers on the project that uh, this, this history had to sing. And I don't know if we've accomplished that, but I think that we have created a readable, a readable history that will appeal to a wide variety of members. So, Today, um, I want to kind of answer two questions. Uh, so what about women's stories and saints? So I've told you what saints is, so what about the women's stories? I mean, this is a day that devoted to that. And then some of you might even be asking, I don't know why, but you might say, why is this something we need to talk about? Uh, and my answer to that was, well, today is devoted to that very thing. This is a, a day where we're talking about uh, women's history and women's uh, issues. Uh, and it's a very uh, important for other reasons as well. Um, recently, Elder Quinton L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve 
uh, went to BYU-Idaho and gave a, a devotional uh, in which he talked about some of the things that we're doing uh, in the church history department. Uh, he spoke uh, for about half the time on saints, but he also addressed other projects as well, uh, including the work that's uh, being done right now in women's history. Uh, and we've already heard a few presentations about that today, specifically uh, from Jenny and, and, uh, and Matt. But uh, this, is what, this is something that he said that, that struck me. He said, we need to listen to the voices of women from the past, to hear their counsel, to learn from their examples, and be strengthened by their testimonies. And I think Jenny's presentation really touched on that and the importance of, of what uh, the teachings of these women and the words of these women have to offer us today. Um, and I'm going to also talk about a few uh, ideas that I have uh, about why uh, women's stories are important and why they need to be in an official history like saints. Um, as been stated before, uh, we oftentimes don't hear a lot of women's stories in the church, uh, stories about women in history. Uh, and a few reasons have been given for why that is. One of them is, is basically uh, that they're oftentimes hard to find, uh, that they are hidden or they are uh, just, just not readily available in uh, an accessible format like a collection of letters or, or anything like that. It's, it's buried away in the archive. Uh, but fortunately, we, uh, we know that these stories are out there. We are looking for them. Uh, they are waiting to be found. Uh, they are waiting to be read, absorbed, and shared. And Saints is one effort to share some of these stories, stories with a broader audience. Now, I should clarify that Saints tells the story of all church members. So we have stories about men and women. Uh, but my presentation today, like I said, is, is going to be mainly focused on what this new history uh, brings to us as far as women's stories go. Uh, so I, I have three reasons for why we need these stories, and one of them is that a representative history must be representative. So one of the important things about saints is that it's not meant to be a comprehensive history because there is so much material that we can't fit it into four volumes, even four giant volumes. There's just too much out there. So we're trying to write a representative history, and in order for our history to be, history to be representative, it needs to have the stories of women. Uh, and here are a few numbers to help us understand why that is. There are, according to uh, the most recent statistics that we have, there are 16,118,169 members of the church. And as of uh, 2014, or I guess this was 2011, uh, a study was done, uh, and it was, it was discovered that the total church membership in 2011 consisted of 90 males for every 100 females. That means if I understand the statistics correctly, that there are more women in the church than men. Uh, shocking, right? And uh, they need to be represented uh, in the history. And we haven't always done a great job of that, which is something I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, also, just for your information, there are 7.1, approximately 7.1 million members of the Relief Society. And unfortunately, I don't have any numbers uh, to, to tell you about the number of young women and, and, and primary girls, but I imagine you know, it's, it's, it's you know, a sizable number as well. And so these stories need to be told um, in order for our history to be truly representative. One thing that we're hearing a lot, especially in the media today, is that representation matters. Um, one person has said that representation in a narrative, in a story, signifies social existence. Absence means symbolic annihilation. Now, I don't know if that is overstatement. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. Because if you think about it, what would it be like to never see someone who looks like you or believes like you do in a book or in a film or on television? What if you never saw a representation of yourself, especially a positive representation of yourself in the media. Uh, would you feel like you matter? Uh, and that's a, a question that a lot of people have been asking recently. Uh, mainly, and I feel really cool, I don't know if I'm the first person to talk about Wonder Woman and Black Panther and Star Wars at Fair Mormon, but I hope I am. <laughs> but this is, this is something that's been 
uh, in the media recently because of uh, the emergence of uh, certain narratives, uh, you know, uh, that that show. Um, hold on a second. The emergence of certain narratives that 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 uh, you know these these are these are uh, stories that uh, belong in genres that have been typically male dominated, and for the first time we're beginning to see people of color take places where white men used to occupy, or women uh, begin to to take on roles that are empowering and inspiring uh, for the first time. Uh, uh, so this has become a mantra. It feels like Black Panther, Wonder Woman, and, and Star Wars, The Last Jedi, are bringing more diversity to the big screen, uh, populating previously male-dominated genres with strong women and people of color. We're learning that representation opens up the minds to possibilities. It is empowering. Uh, one thing that we sometimes hear is that if she can see it, she can be it, right? And so if you can see a positive role model on screen, you can become that. You can aspire to that because you know it's possible. Uh, I don't know how that relates to Wonder Woman or to Black Panther. Uh, you know, I don't know if there are many people out there who, who go to Black Panther and say, wow, I think that I be could become a teenage scientist in an Afro-futuristic hidden civilization. But they could say, they could go to this movie and say, wow, that character is so smart. She's a scientist. I want to be a scientist too. If she can do it, I can do it too. Uh, and that's something that that we're beginning to realize uh, as far as media goes, the power of media. Um, this has also been something that uh, relates as well to our, our history. Uh, for the longest time, as far as representation is concerned, uh, in the 19th century, Mormons uh, were not represented well in the media. Uh, so, for example, here on the left, you can kind of see an anti-Mormon uh, publication. And for the longest time, uh, the only real representations you saw of Mormons in the media were of these, these deviants, uh, or these, these, these ignorant people, or these oppressed people. And what happened was, around the turn of the last century, several uh, writers like Nephi Anderson or Susie Young Gates began to write stories about Mormons, to give young Mormons uh, people to look up to, to see, uh, they, they wanted to, to provide representatives of the church who could serve as models for the rising generation who needed something other than what they were getting in the media. Uh, and so I think that this kind of brings us to our next point, which is that the rising generation needs role models as well. The notion of a role model takes the idea of representation one step further. That is, it is not enough for people to see others who look like them portrayed in movies or books. In many ways, representation can limit an individual just as well as it can empower her. Representatives must help them to aspire to something greater. Uh, president Bonnie L. Oscarson, former general president of the Young Women's Organization, said this. She said, all women need to see themselves as essential participants in the work of the priesthood. Women in this church are presidents, counselors, teachers, members of councils, sisters and mothers, and the kingdom of God cannot function unless we rise up and fulfill our duties with faith. Sometimes we just need to have a greater vision of what is possible. Uh, President Oscarson's vision can be accomplished in a variety of ways. I believe the true stories we tell about ourselves as a church have the potential to give us a greater vision of what is possible. We need stories about Mormon women role models, past and present, who show our rising generation what is possible. Saints seek to provide a variety of role, saints seeks to provide a variety of role models to the women of the church, and especially the rising generation of women. And my third point here is that, and this has been said time and time again today, is that women have always been key players in the restoration. Uh, and we keep saying that because it's true. Uh, earlier, Jenny talked about uh, the two books that have been recently published by the Church Historians Press, uh, The First 50 Years of Relief Society, At the Pulpit. Um, Matt also talked about uh, certain things that have been published online about women to help us share women's stories. So we're beginning to do this uh, better. But 
sometimes what I like to do, uh, just as an experiment, is kind of ask a classroom, maybe a Sunday school class or a class of youth, if they can name 10 women from church history. Now, I could ask the same question here, but I think, I hope, that this crowd could probably come up with at least 10. Is that true? Okay, let's hope so. If not, don't say anything, just go home and do your homework, right? Uh, no need to embarrass yourself. Uh, but I actually, the other day at, uh, at dinner, I asked my, my daughters if they could do this. And this is, I feel really ashamed now as a parent. I have not been doing my job. But I asked my daughters if they could, could come up with uh, 10 women from church history. And uh, any guesses uh, as to how many they came up with? They're 13, 11, 9, and 4. I wish it were five. It was four, right? And I felt really, I felt really embarrassed by that, but, or embarrassed for myself, uh, but, but we afterwards had a great conversation about, uh, you know, who some of these women are. And I'm hoping that as saints come out, as, as the volumes come out, that, that uh, when this question is asked, that no one will, will have to hesitate. No one will not be able to come up with 10 names because we have tried very hard as a team to include women in this official history of the church. Uh, just, just, I don't know how useful this, 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 this table is. I, I kind of went through recent church histories, and this is not very helpful because I should have kind of counted all the men, but I didn't have time for that. I'll do it eventually, but, but I, 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 would, I do have the numbers up for saints. But our heritage, uh, which is, it covers 191 years, uh, it's 146 pages, there are 35 women mentioned in those pages. Uh, and most of the time they're mentioned about once. Uh, they don't come back to the same people usually. The same is true for the church history of the fullness of time, times which spans uh, 365 years uh, with 649 pages with 70 women mentioned. And very few of those women, incidentally, uh, were from the 20th century. Most of those mentioned were women from the 19th, uh, which is true generally for all these. The best one, uh, was Daughters of My Kingdom, that actually is, I mean, the women are very well represented in the history of the Relief Society, uh, so that's good. Uh, there were 82 there, uh, and it's, um, you know, that's 181 pages spanning 169 years. Uh, you know, they, they do a, a fantastic job, I think, in that book, covering women's history. Uh, and then Saints, uh, we cover 31 years in Volume 1. Uh, it's 586 pages of narrative, and we we uh, have 120 women represented in, in the book. And here's just a list of, now, these are all approximate numbers. Uh, I tried to go through and, and get everybody. I hope I got everybody, but these are uh, the list of all the women who are at least mentioned in Saints, and those that are bolded are the ones that uh, uh, we have what I call meaningful engagement in the, in the narrative. In other words, that they are featured, they, they, we, we usually tell their stories, or um, you know, we get their words, or we see their actions and the consequences of their actions. Uh, and so some of these names you might recognize, uh, you know, the first one on the list, for example, is Lucy Mack Smith. Uh, we tell her story, she is a major character, as is Emma Hale Smith. Uh, but other, other characters you, you may not be familiar with, uh, but I am very, very excited for, for these women to become uh, household names among the saints. Uh, for example, I, I have fallen in love with the story of Louisa Pratt and Addison Pratt, their family, but Louisa Pratt is an amazing woman and her story is told uh, in both this volume and the next in volume two. Uh, another one that I have grown to admire greatly is Phoebe Carter, who you may know as Phoebe Carter Woodruff. Uh, and uh, she also has an amazing story where she, she um, has to make a choice between staying with her family in Maine or gathering with the saints in Kirtland, and she ultimately chooses and has, uh, chooses to go to Kirtland and gather with the saints there. She eventually returns home after she, she marries Wilford Woodruff, and she again is forced, or she again makes the choice uh, to decide, you know, do I stay here with my family, uh, or do I go to Missouri where I know things are bad for the saints, and she again chooses to gather with the saints. And time and time again, her faith is tested, and we see uh, some wonderful stories from her. Uh, you'll also notice on the list that we do have, uh, and I think this might be the first time uh, in a church publication, an official church history like this, where we talk about uh, people of color. So we have the story of Jane Manning, for example, 
uh, and her family. But also we have uh, the stories of Repa and Telii. Those are uh, two uh, saints from the, the island of Tubuai uh, who were uh, some of the early converts uh, during Addison Pratt's mission there to the, to the South Seas. Uh, so we try to, to, to have a variety of, of, of stories by women in this, in this history. And also we try to tell as diverse and as global as a story as possible. Uh, so we're very excited for, for you to learn the stories of these women. And uh, I want to spend, uh, spend the rest of my presentation just talking about five of these women and um, sharing with you. I'm actually going to read to you from saints uh, and read their stories to you from saints. So that's why I say this is kind of like story time. Uh, you may recognize some of them, some of them you may be meeting for the first time. Uh, the first one we're going to be talking about is uh, Emma Hale Smith, uh, who we've already talked about a little bit today. But in all of these stories, uh, I, I, I selected them because they are specifically about women whose, whose actions made a difference in the church and who helped shape the direction of the church because of the choices they made. Uh, and so the first one, like I said, is Emma Hale Smith, arguably, arguably the best known woman in church history. Uh, she's known for uh, DNC 25, the first hymnal, the Organization of the Relief Society. But we see quite a few uh, faces of Emma in this history. Uh, she's a very complex character, which is, which is always a, a treat to work with. Uh, and I'm so excited to, to, uh, to, to have uh, saints get to know her better uh, and learn more about who she is and what her personality was like. Uh, and her relationship with Joseph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you just a brief uh, excerpt from, uh, from Saints. Uh, this uh, takes place in 1842. Joseph is in hiding. Uh, if you remember, in 1842, he was accused of, of helping to assassinate uh, Governor Boggs in Missouri, and he went into hiding to escape uh, arrest and imprisonment. And while he was in hiding, he relied heavily on Emma and depended greatly on her. So, so bear with me. I am going to read this to you. Please stay awake. Uh, so here we go. This is from a chapter entitled The Seventh Trouble. Emma communicated... Reg well, let me uh, actually give you something to look at. Emma communicated regularly with Joseph over the following days and weeks. When they could not meet in person, they exchanged letters. When she could evade the lawmen who watched her every action, she joined him at a safe house and strategized about their next move. Often she relayed Joseph's messages to and from the saints, choosing which people he should trust and dodging those who meant him harm. With sheriffs threatening to search every house in Illinois if necessary, Joseph knew the saints worried that he would soon be captured and taken back to Missouri. Some of his friends urged him to escape to the pine forest north of Illinois, where saints were harvesting timber for the temple. Joseph hated the idea of running away, preferring to stay in Illinois and see the crisis to the end. But he was willing to go if that was what Emma wanted to do. My safety is with you, he wrote. If you and the children go not with me, I don't go. Part of him yearned to take his family somewhere else, if only for a short time. I am tired of the mean, low, and unhallowed vulgarity of some portions of society in which we live, he told Emma. And I think if I could have a respite of about six months with my family, it would be a savor of life unto life. Emma responded to his letter later that day. I am ready to go with you if you are obliged to leave, she wrote. But still, I feel good confidence that you can be protected without leaving this country. There are more ways than one to take care of you. The next evening, she wrote a letter to Illinois Governor Thomas Carlin, assuring him of Joseph's innocence. Joseph was not in Missouri when the assassination attempt took place, she reasoned and he was innocent of the charges against him. She believed that Joseph would never get a fair trial in Missouri and would likely be murdered instead. I beg you to spare my innocent children the heartrending sorrow of again seeing their father unjustly dragged to prison or to death, she pleaded. The governor responded to Emma a short time later. His letter was polite and carefully worded, insisting that his actions against Joseph were motivated strictly by a sense of duty. He expressed hope that Joseph would submit to the law, and he gave no indication that he was un that he was willing to change his mind on the matter. 
Undeterred, Emma wrote a second letter, this time explaining why arresting her husband was illegal. What good can accrue to the state or the United States or any part of the state or the United States or to yourself or any other individual, she asked the governor, to continue this persecution upon this people or upon Mr. Smith? She sent the letter and waited for a reply. Now, I like this passage uh, for the way it shows Joseph's trust in Emma and his dependence on her. But it especially shows Emma's courage under pressure as well as her sense of justice. And rhetorically, she is articulate and persuasive when she addresses powerful men. So I really like Emma. I think she's a, a great role model that we have in Saints. Another one you might be familiar with is Valate Murray Kimball. Uh, she is probably best known in the church for two things. One is being the wife of Heber C. Kimball and the mother of Helen Marr Kimball and also uh, best known for her part in the Hurrah for Israel story, which I think probably most of us are familiar with. And if you're not, you can read about it in Saints, or really any other church history, because it's everywhere. Um, what's kind of neat about the late is that she was present in Kirtland during the apostasies of the late, 1830, late 1830s uh, because of her... Uh, connection to her husband who was in the Quorum of the Twelve, she knew and she was friends with uh, many of the men who rebelled against Joseph, who apostatized at this time, and she, uh, she uh, loved them, she was friends with them, and she was uh, sad to see, to see the direction they were taking. Um, so she had a front row seat to this apostasy, and fortunately she wrote a letter to her husband Heber about her feelings about what was happening in Kirtland at the time. He was at, he was, uh, Heber was at the time serving a mission in England as one of the first missionaries there. And so we have this wonderful letter where she reflects on these feelings. And fortunately, she also included on the letter uh, an, a short note from Miranda Hyde, who is the wife of Orson Hyde, Heber's companion in England. Um, and so in Saints, we... It's not changing my slide. Oh, there we go. There we go. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, our passage that, that kind of sums up uh, Valade's feelings. Um, so what's happened is, is uh, Joseph, uh, just as context, Joseph uh, had been in Kirtland. He went out to, to visit the saints in Missouri. Then he came back when he found out that his uh, sister-in-law had died. So he and Hiram uh, came back to Kirtland to, to bury Hiram's wife. And uh, so that's where, we, that's where our story picks up. Many saints were relieved to have Joseph back in Kirtland, but any hope that he could restore harmony to the church soon evaporated. Warren Parrish, Luke Johnson, and John Boynton were meeting weekly with Grandison Newell and other enemies of the church to denounce the First Presidency. Former stalwarts like Martin Harris soon joined them, and by the end of the year, the leading dissenters had organized a church of their own. A short time later, Vlake Kimball wrote her husband in England about the state of the church in Ohio. Knowing Heber's love for Luke Johnson and John Boynton, who had been his fellow Corps members, Vallette hesitated to tell him the terrible news. I have no doubt, but it will pain your heart, she wrote Heber. They profess to believe the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, but in works deny them. At the end of the letter, Miranda Hyde added a note to her husband, Orson. Miranda's older brother was Luke Johnson, and the apostasy was just as heartbreaking for her. Such times in Kirtland you never witnessed. As we, as we now have, she wrote, for it seems that all confidence in each other is gone. She had to watch and pray to know for herself the right course to take through the perilous times. If ever I wanted to see you in my life, she told Orson, it is now. I'm going to skip a little bit for time and pick up uh, back at uh, Vallette's point of view. Vallette believed the dissenters were wrong to turn, away from the, to turn away from the saints, yet she felt sorrow for them rather than anger. After all that I have said about this dissenting party, she wrote Heber, there are still some of them that I love, and I have great feeling and pity for them. She knew the collapse of the, sa of the safety society had tried them spiritually and temporally. She too thought that Joseph had made mistakes while managing the institution, but she had not lost faith in the prophet. I have every reason to believe that Joseph has humbled himself before the Lord and repented, she told Heber, and she trusted that the church would weather the storm. The Lord says that he cannot endure chastisement, but did not... The Lord says, he that cannot endure chastisement but denies me cannot be sanctified, she wrote. That might mean facing hostility in Kirtland alone, while she and the children waited for Heber to return from his mission. Or, if things got worse, it would mean abandoning their home and moving to Missouri. If we shall have to flee, she told Heber, I shall. So, 
here we have Vallette giving us a woman's perspective on the Kirtland apostasy, something that is often framed as a crisis affecting male church leaders. Vallette's perspective, along with that of Miranda Hyde, provides a sympathetic view of the dissenters, reminding us that they were once beloved friends and family members. But Vallette's words also bear powerful testimony of Joseph Smith, despite his mistakes and shortcomings. Also, this passage, I, I believe, shows Vallette's courage under pressure and her determination. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to talk about everyone, but I do want to talk about Lucy Morley. How many people out there have ever heard of Lucy Morley? Okay, good. I'm glad to see some people know who she is. This is, this is one of the great discoveries. Uh, I mean, this is a story that's been published before, uh, but for me, it was, it, it, was, it was fun to meet her for the first time. Uh, she is the daughter of Isaac Morley, uh, who is mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants, I think, about four times. Uh, but other than that, she's, she's a, a little-known member. But she played an instrumental role in the, um, the conversions that occurred in Curlin when the first missionaries arrived there. So I'm going to read her story, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about another one. Uh, in the fall of 1830, let me, in the fall of 1830, not far from Kirtland, 15-year-old Lucy Morley finished her usual housework and took a seat beside her employer, Abigail Daniels. As Abigail worked her loom, moving a weaving shuttle back and forth through crisscrossing threads, Lucy wound yarn onto thin spools. The cloth they wove would go to Lucy's mother in exchange for Lucy's services around the Daniels' house. With many children under her roof and no teenage daughters, Abigail relied on Lucy to, to help keep her family clean and fed. While the two worked side by side, they heard a knock at the door. Come in, Abigail called out. Glancing up from her spool, Lucy saw three men enter the room. They were strangers, but they were well-dressed and looked friendly. All three of them appeared to be a few years younger than Abigail, who was in her early 30s. Lucy stood up and brought more chairs into the room. As the men sat down, she took their hats and returned to her seat. The men introduced themselves as Oliver Cowdery, Parley Pratt, and Ziba Peterson preachers from New York who were passing through town on their way to the West. They said the Lord had restored his true gospel to their friend, a prophet named Joseph Smith. As, as they spoke, Lucy quietly attended to her work. The men talked about angels and a set of gold plates the prophet had translated by revelation. They testified that God had sent them on their mission to preach the gospel one last time before the second coming of Jesus Christ. When they finished their message, the rhythmic clatter of Abigail's loom stopped and the woman turned around on her bench. I do not want any of your damnable doctrine taught in my house, she said. We do have profanity in this book. <laughs> Angrily waving the shuttles in their faces, the men tried to persuade her, testifying that their message was true. But Abigail ordered them to leave, saying she did not want them polluting her children with false doctrine. The men asked if she would at least feed them. They were hungry and had not eaten all day. You cannot have anything to eat in my house, Abigail snapped. I do not feed imposters. Suddenly, Lucy spoke up, horrified that Abigail would speak to servants of God so rudely. My father lives one mile from here, she said. He never turns anyone hungry from his door. Go there, and you will be fed and cared for. Fetching their hats, Lucy followed the missionaries outside and showed them how to get to her parents' house. The men thanked her and started down the road. God bless you, they said. After the men were out of sight, Lucy went back into the house. Abigail was at her loom again, running the shuttle back and forth. I hope you feel better now, she said to Lucy, clearly irritated. Yes, I do, replied Lucy. She's a great, she's a great role model. And I think it's great, too, that she's 15, year, 15 years old. She is a my, you know, she was, she's a my maid's age. Uh, and it's significant that... Um, you know, Lucy's kind of offer to feed the missionaries revol resulted in the conversion of her parents and dozens of others on the Morley Farm and in the Kirtland area. The Kirtland conversions became uh, one of the great missionary stories of the church. And Lucy, this young woman, this my maid, so to speak, uh, was a part of it. And I think that's just fantastic. If we're looking for role models, if we, if we want to give our young women an idea of what they are capable of doing, of, of what their potential is, take a look at Lucy Morley. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to skip the story of Janetta Richards. Uh, she's probably one of the better known uh, women uh, in the church, but she was instrumental in the beginnings of the British mission in England. She was one of the first uh, British converts. Uh, and this is just a fantastic picture, by the way, of a couple, uh, Willard Richards and, and uh, Janetta Richards. Um, but we tell her story, uh, but I wanted to talk about Emily Partridge. Uh, and 
how we use her story in, in the new history. So uh, as I was, uh, you know, as, as a team, as we were kind of going through uh, potential stories, looking at, at potential characters, we came across uh, Emily Partridge. And I saw Emily Partridge in many ways as the embodiment of the Latter-day Saint experience in Volume 1. She joined the church as a child near Kirtland, experienced intense persecution in Missouri, including her father's tarring and feathering. Her father was Edward Partridge, uh, the first bishop of the church. Uh, she experienced malaria in Nauvoo, uh, where she lost both her sister and her father. And she joined the Relief Society, and at age 19, she became one of the first women to practice plural marriage as one of Joseph Smith's plural wives. Uh, so, <laughs> of all the challenging issues that we address in saints, plural marriage is probably the number one challenging issues. I don't know, know why, but it is. That was a joke. <laughs> probably too soon for that, right? But it is, it is probably the most uh, uh, challenging issue that we address in, in uh, Saints Volume 1. Uh, that's for a number of reasons. One, it is, it is the most controversial issue uh, in the church, or one of the most controversial issues. Uh, people struggle with it. They struggle to understand it. Uh, the source material, another reason is the source material for uh, Nauvoo plural marriage is not great. Uh, in fact, it often creates uh, more questions than it provides answers to, so it, that's challenging. And uh, finally, Nauvoo plural marriage is so fascinating, so interesting, so, I think, shocking in many ways, that it has the potential to overwhelm the narrative and overshadow everything else happening in Nauvoo. So we had to find the right balance of, of how to tell the story, because it could easily overwhelm our story, and we, we, we didn't want that to happen. We wanted, we wanted Nauvoo to be more... Uh, to be about more than just plural marriage, although we knew that we needed to address this uh, directly. Uh, so knowing we could not cover everything, uh, we tried to select stories that represented the broader story of Nauvoo's plural marriages, uh, as well as the various forms the practice took in the city. Uh, as far as Joseph Smith's plural marriages are concerned, we feature the stories of Fanny Alger, uh, Louisa Beeman, uh, Mary Elizabeth Leitner, and Emily and Eliza Partridge, while also indicating that Joseph... Uh, that Joseph married other women uh, as well. Uh, we were drawn to the Partridge sisters specifically because Emily's recollections uh, helped us address several difficult issues, including what Emma knew about plural marriage and how she felt about it. Uh, their story is among the most painful in saints, but Emily's perspective helps us understand the pain better and I hope sympathize more with those called upon to practice plural marriage at this time. So I am going to read a little bit of Emily's story. All right, and so this uh, opens, I believe, in 1843. Uh, the Mississippi River froze solid that winter, blocking the usual traffic of rafts and river boats up and down the water. Snow fell often, and icy winds cut across the flatlands and over the bluff. Few saints stayed outside long, since many of them had only low shoes, thin jackets, and threadbare shawls to protect them from the cold and slush. As the end of winter approached, a bitter, chill, a bitter chill still hung in the air while Emily Partridge washed clothes and tended children at the Smith home. For more than two years, she and her older sister Eliza had been living and working with the saints not far from where their mother lived with her new husband. Emily belonged to the Relief Society and talked often with the women around her. Occasionally, she would hear whispers about plural marriage. More than 30 saints had quietly embraced the practice, including two of her stepsisters and one of her stepbrothers. Emily herself knew nothing about it firsthand. A year earlier, however, Joseph had mentioned that he had something to tell her. He had offered to write it in a letter, but she asked him not to do so, worried that it might say something about plural marriage. Afterwards, she had regretted her decision and told her sister about the conversation, sharing what little she knew about the practice. Eliza appeared upset, so Emily said nothing more. With no one to confide in, Emily felt like she was struggling alone in deep water. She turned to the Lord and prayed to know what to do, and after some months, she received divine confirmation that she should listen to what Joseph had to say to her, even if it had to do with plural marriage. On March 4th, a few days after her 19th birthday, Joseph asked to speak with Emily at the home of Hubert Kimball. She set out as soon as she finished work, her mind ready to receive the principle of plural marriage. As expected, Joseph taught it to her and asked if she would be sealed to him. She agreed, and Heber performed the ordinance. 
Four days later, her sister Eliza was sealed to Joseph too. The sisters could now talk to each other and share what they understood and felt about the covenants they made. So this is, uh, in terms of Emily's story uh, with plural marriage, uh, we, we address it in three scenes. I'm going to read to you two of them. The, the middle scene uh, has to, to deal with uh, one of the more uncomfortable moments in church history when, when uh, Emma gives Joseph permission to, to marry uh, additional wives, provided that she's allowed to choose them. And she happens to choose Eliza and Emily, likely not knowing that Joseph had already uh, been sealed to them. And so it suggests some deceit on Joseph's part, and so that's something that we address in a scene. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do is read the final scene, and this picks up uh, after the second ceiling, uh, and it depicts uh, kind of what life was like in the mansion, the Nauvoo mansion, uh, after Joseph has not only married the Partridge sisters who are living in the house, but also the Lawrence sisters. Um, and as you can imagine, Emma is not very happy about this. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read this. So that fall, as her family settled into the new house, Emma became increasingly troubled over plural marriage. In his revelation to her 13 years earlier, the Lord had promised to crown her with righteousness if she honored her covenants and kept the commandments continually. Except thou do this, he had said, where I am, you cannot come. Emma wanted to keep the covenant she had made with Joseph and the Lord, but plural marriage often seemed too much to bear. Although she had allowed some of Joseph's plural wives into her household, she resented their presence and sometimes made life unpleasant for them. Eventually, Emma demanded that Emily and Eliza Partridge leave the house for good. With Joseph at her side, Emma called the sisters into her room and told them that they had to end the relationship with him at once. Feeling cast off, Emily left the room, angry at Emma and Joseph. When the Lord commands, she told herself, his word is not to be trifled with. She intended to do as Emma wished, but she refused to break her, her marriage covenant. Joseph followed the sisters out of the room and found Emily downstairs. How do you feel, Emily? He asked. I expect I feel as anybody would under the circumstances, she said, glancing at Joseph. He looked like he was ready to sink into the earth, and Emily felt sorry for him. She wanted to say something more, but he left the room before she could speak. Decades later, when Emily was an old woman, she reflected on these painful days. By then, she better understood Emma's complicated feelings about plural marriage and the pain it caused her. I know it was hard for Emma and any woman to enter plural marriage in those days, she wrote, and I do not know, as anybody would, and I do not know as anybody would have done any better than Emma did under these circumstances. God must be the judge, she concluded, not I. I think I skipped a page here. All right. I'm not going to worry about the PowerPoint. So I need to conclude here, but um, actually I do want to show one more slide if I can. There we go. One more. There we go. Uh, I just want to conclude uh, and just say a little bit about, um, about this quote from Laurel, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, the, the historian, the eminent Mormon historian. Uh, Mormon sisters wanted God to remember them. They wanted their family and friends to remember them. And though they didn't always admit it, many of them also wanted future generations to remember them. Uh, I believe saints can help us remember these women. They wrote down their stories uh, in letters and journals and recollections because they wanted to be remembered. Even if they didn't admit that, I think deep down they wanted to be remembered. It is my hope uh, that saints will help us remember these women, share their stories, and pass them on to the rising generation. It's my hope that these volumes will become household, that the women in these volumes will become household names, that they will become role models and even mentors and teachers from the other side of the veil. As modern saints, we need to make sure the lives, words, and examples of these women become a part of who we are as a people and as a church, so that their faith and influence can live on and strengthen generations to come. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Uh, the first one is, will there be a movie? <laughs> I have no idea. We can only hope, right? I don't know. 
Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, I'll, so, so this question says, talk about how saints is handling controversial subjects. If people have uh, bought into the narrative that the church has hidden its history, will this help? Uh, so this is something I think Stephen Harper will talk more about on Friday, so I don't really want to steal his thunder, but I think, um, I think that, just my short answer is yes, I think this will help. We have tried very hard to be transparent in these stories. We can't provide all the details. For those of you, for example, who know the story of Emily Partridge, you'll know that we, we haven't provided all the great details that Emily, who is a great writer, provided us, uh, just for the sake of time. Like I said, it's, it's a 600-page it's a narrative. We have a hard time uh, kind of negotiating what stays in and what, what stays out. So we've tried very hard, though, to, to make it a transparent uh, history and to provide access to the sources that we use uh, through, through uh, hyperlinks and whatnot. So we link to the Joseph Smith papers and other sources that are online. Uh, so we provide all of our sources. We have additional uh, topic essays that go along with um, the narrative, which you can find in uh, the, the Gospel Library app as well, uh, that are associated with saints. And so we are trying very hard to get information out there. So I think it will help uh, in that, but I'm sure Steve will have more to say about that on Friday. Okay, this is a very good question. Some, uh, say something about how you have used the source material as a basis for the narrative. How much is fictional, uh, and there are scare quotes around fictional, uh, how much is fictional, how have you stayed with, uh, st how, how closely have you stayed with source material? So, so uh, even though Saints oftentimes reads novelistically. It is, it is nonfiction. Uh, we stay extremely close. In fact, this is what makes my job difficult, is that as a creative writer, I really, really, really want to make stuff up. I really want to like, get into Joseph's head and talk about all his motivations and get into Emma's head and, you know, or create dialogue that's really juicy, that sort of thing, to make the narrative even more compelling. But we cannot do that. If the narrative says that it was raining, we like to say it was raining. The sources say that it was raining. We don't make stuff up. Um, so uh, we don't fictionalize anything. We don't make up any of the dialogue. All that comes from sources. All the details that are in the text come from the sources. Uh, and we provide the sources. So if you, are, if you really want to find out if you know, Lucy Morley actually said what she said or if, if uh, Abigail Daniels was really sitting next to a loom, you can go to the source and see that. Uh, and so even facial expressions, we don't make up facial expressions. Uh, uh, we don't even say that a character looked at another one unless it's in the source. And so we're, we try to be very, very, very close to the sources. Um, so. Uh, okay, very good question. Two very good questions. The first one is, will uh, saints eventually include any accounts of faithful LGBTQ church members? Uh, the answer is, uh, we are looking into that right now. Uh, we're in the process of drafting volume four, which uh, is, is the volume that covers everything from 1955 to the present. Uh, so we are, uh, in fact, talking about this uh, now, and, and uh, so we are um, hopeful that we will include accounts of faithful LGBTQ members, because uh, that is part of our history, part of our story, especially today. Uh, so it's something that we plan to address. Uh, and the second question is, does, this, does saints include a female perspective of the 1844 succession crisis? The answer is yes. But I'm just going to leave that. So you buy the book. Oh, I got another snack here. Yeah. How much time do I have? Are we... Okay, good. Uh, here's a question. I've enjoyed the serialized chapters of Saints and the Ensign. Are these abridged or full chapters from the books? These are full chapters. Uh, I don't think, yeah, they're not abridged. So what we've tried to do is try to keep the chapters short. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, each chapter is kind of broken up into scenes. We, we've tried to capture a very cinematic feel um, in the narrative, something that you might recognize, um, storytelling techniques that you might recognize from serialized television or film, something like that. And so we have short scenes. The narrative create, is created up, of, is cre composed of short scenes as well as short chapters, I think. 
the longest chapter is usually about 4,000 words, although we try to keep them uh, around 2,500 words or maybe 3,500 words. Um, so those are full chapters in the end sign. Uh, will all of the chapters eventually be available with audio online? The answer is yes. On September 4th, everything will go live, including the audiobook. Uh, and I believe also you can toggle, when the audiobook appears, you can toggle between a male narrator and a female narrator. So, just FYI. And, and also, we'll have an audiobook in Spanish and Portuguese either on September 4th or sometime um, in the near future. Uh, what is the publication schedule for remaining volumes? Any idea how these will be used in curriculum? Uh, so the first question is, uh, I think the plan is to release one every year. Uh, so I think volume two is scheduled to come out next year. But uh, if it doesn't come out until the year after, don't come after me. We're trying. <laughs> these are really big books. We're trying to do it right. Uh, but yeah, they, they, the plan is to kind of release one uh, every year after the first volume. And then second question, any idea how these will be used in curriculum? This is again something Steve will probably address on Friday, but uh, I do know that the Institute classes in, uh, about church history will be using saints as part of their, their textbooks. How much more time do I have? Do I need to? There's one more you can come in. Pick two of Okay, I get to pick two. There are lots of questions here. Um, I'm a slow reader, sorry. <laughs> Looks like several people want to know if we address the issue of offspring from Joseph and his plural wives. The answer is those uh, that, that uh, we don't really address that in saints, although we leave that to the uh, gospel topics essay. So there are some things, especially with plural marriage, that we're just not able to address in the book. Uh, and so either the topics essay associated with uh, saints will address that, or the gospel topics essay. Uh, top gospel topics essays. What's said in those essays will will kind of cover that issue. Um, but that's really all I know about that. You might want to ask Steve about that more on Friday. Uh, and I'll just take one more of these. Um, what percent of Volume One is already in the two existing church histories? Uh, um, that is, um, I don't know. Uh, I would say that you are likely to find familiar stories in Saints, but you are also likely to find some stories that are new to you. And we tried very hard to kind of keep the stories that people are familiar with, that people love, that cherish, that still teach us great lessons today, but also to include more stories. Uh, many of them, by the way, are about women. Many of the new stories that you will find have to do with our, our women uh, characters. And then uh, they had a second question. Uh, he looked like he was ready to sink into the earth. Are such passages documented or presumed? Uh, that one, I believe, is documented. I mean, like I said, we, we, we don't say it unless it's in there. And uh, Emily Partridge, in one of her memoirs, says something to that effect. So, um, thank you.